My name's John Harris. I'm a chartered accountant. I qualified in 1984. And one of my very first clients was a large landed estate in Northamptonshire. And the farm manager was a chap called Richard Wilborn. And that we so we first met in around 1986-87. And in August 87, Rudolf Hess died in Spandau, Berlin. That prompted a lot of newspaper coverage as to uh, his flight back in the 40s. And at that time, there was actually very little that had been published. The leading book at that time was um, by James Douglas Hamilton, Motive for a Mission. And what that was very much trying to do was basically clear his father's name from any serious involvement in the affair. Um, I don't think it particularly worked. And a lot of people were still relying on the official German communique in May 41, which said that Rudolf Hess had gone mad. He was delusional. He'd stolen a plane against Hitler's orders and flown to the enemy. And that was it. And a lot of people, I think, were prepared to believe that on the basis that Hess's uh, performances at Nuremberg were, were really quite bizarre. But it didn't take long for us to start delving into some of the documentation surrounding the affair to find out that the official story was far from the complete truth. And that was in 1987. And here we are, what? 30 some odd years later. Well, this, I mean, it's a fascinating it's, story, um, John. Um, we've got this guy who was uh, really the deputy Fuhrer in Nazi Germany, hopping in a plane, apparently pinching it uh, and flying all the way to Britain on a peace mission of his very own. Now, one does wonder if he was encouraged to do this. Uh, I know afterwards, and this is uh, in May 1941, uh, before, actually, the the real big phases of the war had started, that is to say, the um, the war between Russia uh, or the Soviet Union, as it was, and Nazi Germany, and also, of course, uh, bringing the Americans into the war and the Japanese. You know, so uh, this this was uh, before all this happened, and it almost seems like a, a kind of trigger event of some time, or or maybe it was to do with the negotiations that were going on before the war took a big step up in terms of you know its its geographical scope uh, and its seriousness, I suppose, in the number of people who were being involved in it, and the fact that really this now was a world war rather than just a a European war. Uh, it was stretching out it much much wider. So. Uh, just tell us, if you can, please, who is this guy, Rudolf Hess? Because I know he'd known Adolf Hitler um, right till the uh, back to the early days of the Nazi Party. That's correct. Can I just before I do that? Can I just talk about the turning point? A lot of people have seen the Hess flight as the turning point of World War Two, simply because up until the Hess flight, the possibility of peace was always there. The Germans had spent a lot of time during the summer of 1940 and the autumn of 1940 throwing and arranging various peace initiatives. Rab Butler in the Foreign Office at that time was nicknamed the Minister for Peace Overture. So many had been made. After the, after the Hess affair and when it basically failed, um, World War II became a bitter fight to the end. So a lot of people have seen the Hess, the Hess flight very much in terms of the turning point. Up until up until the Hess flight, there was all well, it was basically the phony war. But thereafter, it escalated very quickly and was, I'm afraid, a, a battle until the end. But in terms of Rudolf Hess, who was he? Somewhat bizarrely, Rudolf Hess wasn't even a, uh, wasn't born in Germany. He was born in Alexandria, Egypt, in 1894. His father was a German who had um, emigrated to Alexandria to set up a trading company, um, Hess and Co. in the 1880s. And Rudolf Hess, unlike some of the other Nazis, was actually born into quite a middle class 
trading family. Uh, they had an estate at a place called Reich Goldsgrun, um, northeast of Munich. And every summer, the family would return back to the family estate uh, from Alexandria. Hess uh, undertook a very traditional German uh, education. Uh, he learned how to speak French and he went to business school. And the first few years of his education were very much aimed at basically him following in his father's footsteps. Then came the war and uh, he fought with distinction, he got an iron cross as firstly as an infantry man. Then he was shot through the lung in 1917 in Romania and returned back to the family estate for re uh, uh, recuperation. And following his recuperation, he then joined the fledgling Luftwaffe and learned how to fly um, some of their planes just before the end of the war. So he'd actually got quite a distinguished um, milit military career. Uh, I think it's come, it's come to the um, attention of some that he was actually serving in the same regiment as Hitler through part of the war, but the two men are not supposed to have met. That came later in Munich when Hess was a student at uh, Munich University. So early days, uh, early 1920s, Munich was basically a maelstrom of political upheaval. Um, there was a vacuum following the defeat of World War I. Uh, communism was trying to take hold, and there was a right, right wing reaction against that movement. Um, and that's where Hess and Hitler came to, came to power. They first tried to grab power seriously in 1923 with the Munich Beer Hall Putsch, which failed. For their pains, they ended up in Landsberg prison. They were there together for some 18 months. And it's during that period that Hitler supposedly dictated the turgid mine camp to uh, Hess, who acted as secretary. They both were uh, released in 1925, armed with their um, political philosophy, and thereafter set about um, forming and developing the Nazi party, which eventually assumed power in January 1933. Hitler was the um, leader, the Führer, and Hess his deputy. Um, and that, that relationship developed right the way through the 30s. But I think it's fair to say that by the time of the flight, two men were not as close as they had been originally, not because they'd fallen out necessarily. I think Hitler implicitly trusted Hess. But Hess was tasked with the um, civil administration of Germany, and obviously in times of war, the military and the military generals and uh, air uh, and naval commanders and air commanders uh, do gain ascendancy. So consequently, Hess's relationship with Hitler had probably changed. I wouldn't say it was any less sincere, um, but certainly in times of war, military men do tend to become uh, do do tend to come to the fore. So that's who. So in in late autumn 1940, Hess was basically in charge of the civil administration. He was party chairman, so he was in charge of the Nazi Party, which was based in the Brown House in Munich. Typically, his week would be part admin as far as attending Munich Brown House, and then he would fly in his own. Uh, plane, a Junkers 52 to Berlin, where he would assume na uh, his national role of uh, 
of, Dep of, De of Deputy Führer. He had an office at 64 Wilhelmstrasse, uh, very close to the Avalon Hotel. And so he would spend his time, some in, uh, some in Berlin and uh, in Munich, where, he, where his principal house was. So he was very much rather like Hitler, coming from the south of the country rather than the Prussian north. So, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it, that he spent this time in prison with Hitler. Obviously, they would have uh, formed an enormous, powerful bond there. Uh, but it wasn't just that, was it? Because in 1925, Hitler named Hess his private secretary. And now this is eight years before the Nazi party actually came to power. So during all the uh, sort of build up to the Nazis actually amazingly being democratically elected to power, uh, the, these two were absolutely uh, un inseparable, one would imagine, as a private secretary to the leader of a political party. Uh, so their relationship was very close. Now, uh, one, it what does actually start to question what's going on when these two that were so close had completely different, it, it seems, ideas when it came to the 10th of May 1941. I suppose the question, John, is really when Hess hops into his Messerschmitt and sets off for the UK, uh, it would have been known, I suppose, uh, potentially beforehand, that this was going to be a, a failed mission. But maybe perhaps Hess was prepared to accept it in the knowledge that if it all did go wrong, as it did, uh, that everyone in uh, in Nazi Germany would just uh, simply deny any knowledge of it. So have you managed to figure out whether this was something that uh, that was genuinely a spontaneous act uh, and, and that uh, Hess had not spoken to anyone about? Uh, I suppose at the, at the core of that question is, you know, how close was Hess to Hitler in the run-up to the uh, flight and uh, how isolated was he or was he a sort of, you know, part of the party enjoying the fun of the war? Okay, so what, we, what we've actually established, I think, is a fairly clear chronology. Um, Germany had invaded uh, France successfully in 28 days. And shortly after the armistice in Compagne, um, Hitler then advised um, his closest confidence that Russia was next on his list. And as early as August 1940, uh, officers had been sent to uh, Poland to, to look at potential sites for HQ for an Eastern campaign. I think that, that scared Hess considerably. Um, it's important to point out the obvious. When Germany invaded France, Hess didn't fly anywhere. Why? Because I think he was reasonably confident of the outcome. It was only when stakes were immeasurably notched up uh, with the German invasion of Russia that Hess started to think laterally or to think about how he might um, for some form of compromise peace with the British. Up until that time, he had gone along with the military conquests, um, but, very, but Barbarossa was very much a different kettle of fish in that um, the intelligence wasn't there. They didn't know really the true strength of what they were up against. And clearly a Western peace prior to an Eastern invasion would be an infinitely more secure um, prognosis or, or would hopefully secure a better outcome. I, I suppose what I'm saying, John, is was there any indication, you know, in the spring or early 1941 that Hess was already kind of departing ideologically from the rest of the Lancy leadership? I don't think he was necessarily departing ideologically ideologically, he, what he was trying to do was basically um, go into that, uh, allow Hitler to go in, to go eastwards with a secure, with a secure western border. As it was, the, the military had not managed to quell Britain. Uh, as we know, the Battle of Britain had ended up as a, uh, as a draw, essentially. The British Navy was still unbowed. 
So any any um, attempt at a British invasion was going to be a bloodbath. Yeah, can I just say, I think, I think you know, you could say it's a draw, but I would just push you a little bit to say I think we won the Battle of Britain in that the object of the um, Nazis at the time in 1940 was really to gain air superiority, and they realised um, by, actually, I think it was eight months of the Blitz, that they were losing so many aircraft coming over to bomb British cities airfields etc that it wasn't a sustainable campaign so i think you know there are differences obviously between historians but i wonder whether you think maybe that actually was a victory that that in, increased the uh, necessity of the nazis to look elsewhere if they were going to continue uh, no, taking no. territory no no i don't agree with that i think the battle of britain showed that um germany couldn't invade britain in the autumn of 1940 um, but what what Germany then responded by doing was trying to bomb Britain to the negotiating table through the Blitz, and that failed as well. So Britain didn't go to the negotiating table, and that's what made the likelihood or possibility of the Hess mission so plausible and believable. Um, it's it, if somebody tells you something that you want to hear, it might, if you, on a bad day, it might make you more willing to believe it. And I think people were telling Hess what Hess wanted desperately to hear. And I think that played a large part in his decision to jump in, into a plane. But it certainly wasn't a spontaneous act. Um, he had, I, I think we can virtually nail the date and the time that the Hess affair started. I would I would uh, suggest it started at the 31st of August 1940 in the Grunwald uh, forest just to the south of Munich where Hess met Karl Haushofer his university professor specifically to talk about the prospect of a German British peace by that time it was fairly obvious that the battle of britain was going to be quite a prolonged struggle and the outcome was far from clear cut so what hess asked his professor was whether or not there was any other form of non-governmental approach that could achieve some form of peace and it, it was that meeting that then set off the trail of events that i believe led to hess flying some 10 months later and this is you know it's been well documented for a long time that Hess then got Albrecht Haushofer, Karl's son, to write a letter to the Duke of Hamilton, and that was dated the 23rd of September 1940. But the key, the key was that that letter never reached the recipient. The Duke of Hamilton was shown the letter a lot later, but it was intercepted by the censors. And on the 1st of November 1940, this letter inviting the Duke of Hamilton to fly uh, to the outskirts of Europe, I think was the phrase um, that was used, uh, was intercepted by MI5, MI6 and SOE. And I think that is the key fact, because from that time onwards, I think those intelligence agencies were then using that knowledge basically to lure Hess into, into Scotland, which ultimately succeeded, probably beyond their wildest dreams. OK, but what, what, was, what was the purpose of that then? Buying time. So every, every day that you offer the prospect of a negotiated settlement means that you don't have to organise an invasion. And that... that I think is it, it, this could be British intelligence's finest hour, that they prevented an invasion of Maine and Britain by offering a viable or a plausible peace. And it was and it was uh, believable enough to in to entice the deputy Fuhrer to get into his plane and fly to Scotland. Okay, what was Hamilton's role then? 
I don't think Hamilton need necessarily have known anything about it. I think he was just being used as a figurehead and as an intermediary between Hess and the means of affecting the peace. I'm sure Hess would have known that there were Nazi sympathisers in Britain, um, not least of which, of course, had been uh, Edward VIII, who had to advocate, uh, and Mrs Simpson, who were then, by then, had been sent off to the Bahamas, you know, get them right out of the way. Uh, but, but I mean, you know, I would have thought that it, there was actually a, a, a genuine pro-Nazi faction in, in the UK still, even in 1941, that was keeping its head down and may possibly have been uh, yeah. either used by the intelligence services or genuinely in touch with uh, through diplomatic channels with um, or you know, unofficial channels with the Nazi leadership. Yeah, I think self-interest comes into play here. And I wouldn't like to say that there were a lot of pro-Nazis. There were probably a lot of anti-communists and a lot of people in the UK saw communism as a far greater threat than Hitler and his fascists who were acting as a bulwark between Britain and and uh, communist Russia. Don't forget the communists had killed their kings, um, they'd spread, communism was, had spread across Europe to a certain extent, the Spanish Civil War was about the spread of communism and the people in this country the ruling classes you know if you've got a 20,000 acre estate I think you're going to be quite fearful of communism coming and taking that away from you that doesn't automatically mean that you're a pro-Nazi but if, if the Nazis if the Nazis um, also avow that communism is their enemy that would probably make you prefer the Nazi state to the fear of communism um, and what that might mean to you and your selfish interests. Moreover, wars are in nobody's interest from a commercial point of view, unless you're making arms. But a lot of co commerce and trade, you know, Britain has always been a trading nation. And if you've got U-boats sinking your ships full of your goods, nobody's going to make any money. So it's not necessarily that Britain was pro-Nazi. But it was certainly anti-communist and it was certainly pro-trade. And that's why the war, that's why I think people might, might have wanted to have done a deal with, the, with, with Germany. Not that they were any great lover of Hitler. In fact, a lot of people saw Hitler as the reason why a peace deal with Germany wasn't possible at that point in time. Um, so... That's what I think Hess was trying to um, take advantage of, the fact that there were a lot of people in the United Kingdom that favoured a settlement with Nazi Germany to the prospect of a battle with communism that a lot of people thought was coming. Now, was there ever any possibility that his flight might be successful, that he might actually... Uh, begin to negotiate peace secretly from Scotland? Ultimately, Tony, I don't think so. And the reason I don't think so is that Churchill, I presume, would have had to have been deposed as Prime Minister before a peace settlement was negotiated. And Churchill held the public uh, um, approval. Churchill's wartime approval rating apparently never fell beneath 70%. So I don't believe that a peace settlement that would have been orchestrated by the great and the good, possibly involving royal involvement, would necessarily have gone down well with the population at... at, at, um, at the, the majority of the uh, British population. And it, it has been mooted that what Hess was trying to do, in actual fact, was to foment a civil war in this country, which would then have taken the pressure off the war effort against Germany, whilst Germany was um, in the initial stages of Barbarossa. So I can imagine, I can see how that might might take 
might have taken place had Hess achieved what he thought he was going to achieve. So do you think then the uh, uh, he was deliberately lured? Uh, it's, that's what sounds what you're saying, that, he, it, that there was never any real prospect of he, what he wanted happening. Uh, if so, were the Brits involved in that? They, you know, there, there's obviously an advantage in, in uh, I suppose, just spinning out one of Hitler's key allies from the middle of the party. No, I think it, I think I think British intelligence definitely lured Hess and encouraged him to fly. But I think it was a very dangerous strategy that they employed, which played out essentially because um, when Hess came and landed straight away. There was a lot of telephone calls to America to reassure America that Britain had peace with Germany. Um, that's the, the killer question here, Tony, is did Hess fly because it was an a clever intelligence lure or was it actually part of a coup d'etat that failed because Hess crashed he didn't land where he meant to, and he fell into Churchill's hands, essentially. That's the killer question, and that's the question that we vacillate between lure one week and coup attempt the next. And it's quite... Some, some participators may have thought that they were taking part in a coup, whilst others thought that they were taking part in a lure. Um, the role of British intelligence is is very indistinct in this matter, and of course there's been no uh, release of any paperwork pertaining to the Hess affair by um, MI6 in particular. Uh, okay, so um, that's yeah, where was... this gets difficult. Yeah, well, I've, I mean, this uh, MI6, I imagine they're burning that much of what they do uh, because. Uh, at least until the people involved are dead, because uh, so much of it is, of course, criminal, you know, with the license to kill and all that. Um, but I know that um, uh, the, the uh, flight actually was, at the time, I believe, was secret. How was it actually reported at the time in Britain? Um, well, the cat was rather let out of the bag. Um, so Hess has crashed it nine minutes past 11 on the Saturday the 10th of May and he was taken initially to a farm workers cottage on adjacent to the farmland that it crashed on and given a cup of tea and one of the soldiers recognized him and made a telephone call to the Glasgow Herald so that was on the Saturday night and on Monday <clears throat> the Glasgow Herald announced that Hess was in Glasgow. Oh, right. So that's pretty much immediately. Do, do we know which airfield he was heading for? Because at night, obviously, if he's landing in a field, it sounds to me like he's got lost. Precisely. So what happened, the biggest mistake with the Hess affair is to take the case that what happened is what meant to happen, is, is what was meant to happen, and nothing could be further from the truth. We believe that Hess got lost over the North Sea. His radio equipment, which was very sophisticated, it was called an Electra uh, navigation system, failed to work at the key moment. And so he was late. So consequently, it was far darker than he had anticipated. So he couldn't see to land. We believe he was going to land at um, a small airstrip called RAF Dundonald, just near to air. He nearly did, uh, but got but got lost at the last minute and had got no other alternative other than to parachute out um, over Eaglesham. And he certainly wasn't going, that certainly wasn't his intent. And what happened subsequently was just as a consequence of him, him being lost, essentially. And then he fell into official hands. He was taken to Mary Hill Barracks eventually in Glasgow and spent the first night there. Um, so he was back in governmental control 
rather than meeting the people that he had intended to meet. Do we do we know who was waiting for him at that airfield? We don't, and I doubt we ever will. Um, so I've spent the last 20 years, um, there, there was a very good book published in 2003 called Double Standards, and that made the case that Prince George, the Duke of Kent, was at the airstrip. Um, they, they thought it was a different air, air base, waiting to meet the, uh, Rudolf Hess prior to taking him to London to meet his brother, who would then prorogue Parliament, which he was quite able to do constitutionally, and then force a negotiated peace in that manner. Now, that sounds very far fetched. So you mean, you mean the King, George VI? The King, George VI, that's correct. So what, what the book was mooting was basically a constitutional coup d'etat, except for the inconvenient truth that the King and the Queen today is actually acting quite within his or her powers to prorogue Parliament. If you remember in the Brexit debate, we very nearly had, uh, well, some people were muting that the Queen would actually prorogue Parliament to resolve Brexit herself. I don't know if you can remember that. That was two or three years ago. And that, that is what's called a reserved power. And George VI certainly had that reserved power. So he could, if he wanted to, prorogue Parliament, replace the Prime Minister with somebody who would then have made a, a compromise peace with Germany. Constitutionally, that was quite possible. Um, but it failed, or it didn't happen, because Hess crashed his plane and fell into government hands. So that, that was the premise of the book. And the problem being, we cannot find out where the Duke of Kent was on that night. Uh, I've written to um, the Duke, and he doesn't answer my letters. Uh, the current Duke, that is. Uh, he doesn't answer my letters. We've made freedom of information requests, but I doubt that will work because um, royal documents are outside the scope of the Freedom of Information Act. And so consequently, I can't tell you tonight where the Duke of Kent was. What I can tell you is on the 8th of May 1941, he was in Peterhead and Fraserburgh, which is Aberdeenshire. And I can also tell you on the 12th of May 1941, the Monday, he was at RAF Wick on, on the, right at the top of Scotland. But that weekend, from the 9th to the 11th of May, his whereabouts are currently unknown. And uh, what doesn't help researchers like myself is that there was a story that he'd had a road tra traffic accident on the Sunday morning just outside of Glasgow. But I don't know if you remember the Ferrari of the inserted document scandal at the National Records. Well, that, that report was part of the document insertion stance scandal where an historian had fabricated uh, what was purporting to be contemporaneous pieces of paper and had actually inserted them into the then current files. And um, unfortunately, the, the road traffic accident document was one of those that was that was subsequently proven to be falsified. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it was uh, William Stevenson, the man called Intrepid, that said nothing deceives like a document. Yeah. So this whole thing of forging documents is just designed. They're like little mines that we can step on, John, uh, and they would love us to. But well done for making sure that, you know, you, you, were, you were doing due diligence there and figuring out that it wasn't. But it certainly sounds as if uh, Prince George was in Scotland. I mean, he is an interesting character. Um, he's obviously uh, one of the Queen's uncles. Um, he was, uh, yeah, so he was... Um, he died, didn't he, about a year after that, just a little bit more than a year after, in an air crash himself. 
he was up in Scotland in a short Sunderland, um, and their aircraft, uh, there's all sorts of rumours about this uh, as to what happened there, and there is a memorial up on the Scottish hills, uh, it, it, up in the Highlands. Uh, in fact, I think it's up near um, Inverness somewhere. It's very high up in Scotland where, that he crashed on the yeah. 25th of August, 1942, a little over a, a year later. So I suppose uh, all his secrets died with him there. But, I mean, it, is there anything you've managed to figure out about that air crash? Uh, um, not really. Only to say that um, Double Standards, the book I referred to again, had got Hess being on that plane. I don't believe that for a minute. Um, funny enough, uh, as part of the research into the Duke of Kent and his potential location, somebody approached me and he said, um, oh, well, you know about the short Sunderland, don't you? And I said, well, it smashed into what's called Eagle's Rock, I think, just by um, Helmsdale in, uh, in Sutherland. He said, oh, yes, but um, it was shot down by friendly fire and apparently the short Sunderland had been intercepted and asked to um, uh, for its friend or foe um, instrumentation be switched on and it wasn't so this chap is convinced that the plane was actually shot down by friendly fire I have no evidence to support that at all um, the only thing I do find odd is that Prince George's body was taken to Dunrobin Castle um, and spent the first night there. It then came down to London and he was buried, I think, in Windsor. Not one member of the Churchill government attended that funeral. It was a completely private funeral, which I find a little bit odd. Admittedly, there was a memorial service subsequently but i do wonder if perhaps prince george had done something that had not endeared himself to the churchillian government i don't know well i mean just looking at the flight plan they didn't follow the flight plan number one uh, they were supposed to fly around the top of uh, at the coast of scotland but they didn't they just set off across the hills now the short sunderland is well known as a, a bit of a lumbering aircraft uh, it's very heavy uh, and it doesn't climb very well. So, you know, the actual rate of climb, if you're heading into some mountains, is is not good. Uh, so they may have well have found themselves, as they're pointing towards the mountains, in a very sticky situation where they're having to head between hills. Uh, I noticed that um, uh, if you look at where the crash was at Eagles Rock, there is a very steep turn. Another thing that Sunderland aircraft don't do very well so it may be that they had some sort of, you know, visual contact with the with the air uh, air around them or the, the mountains, but just simply couldn't make the turn. Uh, the other question is uh, around who was actually on that aircraft, because I know there was actually one survivor, wasn't there? A guy called Andy Jack, the rear gunner, actually walked away. Correct. Well, staggered away. Um, but uh, he lived uh, for some considerable while after the crash. But I think he was effectively silenced, wasn't he? We never, we never heard his his story at all, or was never allowed to hear his story. Yeah, but his uh, niece Margaret Harris certainly has told the story. She uh, was sixty nine years old uh, when the article was written uh, in the North Wales. Uh, on well, it's out. The website is North Wales Live. I think it's the North Wales Daily Post. Uh, she lived in Prestatin, um, and uh, she says her uncle was ordered by the RAF, Andy Jack, not to reveal any details concerning the accident in order to protect the reputation uh, of the Duke. He was the youngest brother of uh, King George uh, VI, who was the, um, uh, the king at the time and said to be a drug user, an alcoholic and bisexual. Uh, Sergeant Jack is believed an unnamed passenger aboard the fateful flight was really the Duke's boyfriend. Uh, and that may have well been a big scandal. I mean, of course, it would no one would bat an eyelid now. But at the time, of course, this was a crime. And so they may, may well have been trying to cover that up. And I noticed that uh, there were 15 uh, passengers uh, on the aircraft. And that's what they said initially. They hadn't 
they counted all, up all the 15 who were supposed to be on the flight. And it was only the next day they realised that Andy Jack had managed to survive uh, and he was made 16 passengers and there were actually only supposed to be um, 15 on there. So th this is quite, I think, quite an interesting turn of events in that um, the guy who was actually on the plane was told to be quiet. Uh, he did. Obviously, he's following orders there in order to protect the royal family and his superior officers. But uh, his um, his niece wasn't quite so discreet, John. No, I, I'm never quite sure what to believe, because presumably in that case, somebody you would have thought would have worked out that somebody had died and that the person's name would have been uh, revealed or somebody would have worked out that somebody had died that had been close to the prince at that time. I think it's, I think there's different issues as well. Apparently, um, there was a briefcase full of Swedish kroner uh, strapped to the body of, of the Duke, and that's, that's how he was found. And then the, uh, the kroner uh, or the briefcase exploded on impact. There is also the question of where, where was the plane going precisely? And I've read various accounts where by the plane there was a missing hour. Some people have speculated that the plane had actually landed, pick up a passenger, and then taken off and then crashed. And the weather apparently was not good on that day either. So I think there's quite a lot still to learn about that particular incident. So I'm quite, I'm quite willing to believe uh, boyfriends or girlfriends as far as the Duke of Kent is concerned. Uh, yeah, the pilot was blamed for the crash. Uh, the other thing that um, Margaret Harris has said about this um, from Prestatin, the niece of Andy Jack, the one surviving rear gunner on that aircraft, it is that uh, she believes that there was a um, uh, uh, some sort of a ulterior motive, really, in, in what was going on, in that the uh, Prince George was drunk. This is what she alleges, and that he ordered uh, the pilot to relinquish the controls and took over flying the aircraft. Uh, and, of course, this is the sort of thing that does happen, in fact, in many many occasions over the years uh, when uh, someone has gone into uh, the causes of a crash, uh, not necessarily drunk, but it, what's happened is that the pilot has been ordered to relinquish the controls to a senior officer, especially if there are military people around. And um, there's allegations uh, about this and the uh, Polish government air crash as well uh, a few years ago when they were going over to the uh, Polish annual memorial festival that... Uh, no. If a pilot uh, is ordered to relinquish the controls by a senior officer who's on board, especially if it's uh, someone as, as high up as Prince George, then they will simply have to do so. And it's, it may well have been that Prince George was drunk and flying the aircraft. So who knows? But anyway, getting back to uh, getting back to Hess, uh, he ended up, didn't he, in, in Spandau prison in Berlin? That's correct. So... Um... He spent most of the Second World War, firstly under at an MI6 safe house. Well, he was the last one of the last prisoners in the Tower of London. So in Scotland, he came down by train and was transported to the Tower of London. Yeah, I don't want to jump you through this. I mean, <clears throat> do we know whereabouts? You know, okay. So he was in the barracks up in Scotland. Uh, what was his trail that eventually led to Berlin? Then, so to be very precise. He crashed at Floors Farm, Eaglesham. He was then taken to Busby Scout Hut, which was the local home, home guard. Then he went to Gifnock Scout Hut, which was the local police station. And he was initially interrogated by a Polish guy called Roman Bataglia. Then at about 3 a.m. in the morning, he was taken to Mary Hill Barracks in the middle of Glasgow. He spent the night, the first night there, and then it was thought sensible to get him out of Glasgow for fear of reprisal bombing. And he then went to Drimmond, which is by Loch Lomond, to Buchanan Castle, which had been a, um, a former 
castle converted to a hospital for the duration of the war. From there, he caught his train on the 17th of May down to London and spent a while at the Tower of London whilst an MI6 safe house was being prepared at Midget Court near Aldershot. And from there, he spent probably about a year there before moving to Abergavenny to a mental hospital where he was uh, uh, imprisoned. Uh, and then he flew from Maidley Airfield in Herefordshire to Nuremberg in October 46, ready for, ready for his trial. I mean, it's interesting that he was sent to a mental hospital. Do we know if he really was crazy? I mean, that was the thing that everybody says that, oh, the Nazis, they were mad. But, I mean, obviously they had their own ideology. Uh, was there any evidence of his you know, personality w w when he was over here? W was uh, he uh, raging? Yeah. You know, do we know? No, he wasn't raging. There have, there, there have been books written about his mental health. J.R. Rees, his uh, psychi psychiatrist, wrote a very good book in 1947 about Hess's mental state. Um, he certainly acted strangely at Nuremberg, but I think that was probably a tactical move because if the Allies had executed Hess showing signs of derangement, would they have been really any better than um, some of the crimes that the Germans themselves had perpetuated? So I think Hess was being very canny there. Before the flight, he didn't show signs of madness or delusion whatsoever. He was idiosyncratic. He was uh, um, a, a very keen adherent of homeopathy. He liked alternative medicines. That doesn't make somebody mad, but it does make them unusual, and particularly for that time. Um, he studied organic farming. So you could argue that he was actually a man ahead of his time rather than delusional or mad. He was a fatty eater. Hitler got fed up with him because he kept bringing his own food to the Berghof to eat. But that doesn't make one mad. And after, after he'd crashed, Tony, in Scotland and ultimately realised that he'd failed, and also probably realised that his the, the outcome or the outlook for him and the rest of his life was fairly bleak. I think you and I would have some mental health issues, given that um, failure, and more importantly, the consequences of that failure. Um, shortly after, you may remember, in late May 41, Bismarck was, sink, was sunk. So he crashed. And he was in British imprisonment by late May 41. And apparently the sinking of the Bismarck greatly affected him, which I think you and I could understand. I think it would affect us too. Does that make us mad? No, I don't think it does. And I think he got more progressively awkward and cussed as he got old, which, again, a lot of British people do too. Now, now, I'm going to try and take you back to what you were saying about the real purpose of the mission, uh, whether Hess knew it or not, uh, and that is to, whether it was about a coup or whether it was just simply a way of spinning one of Hitler's close personal friends out of the orbit of the German leadership. You know, if you had to come down on one side or the other, uh, you, you're sitting on the fence. Uh, I wonder, you know, which, if you had to put your money on one or the other, which is it? Um, at the moment... I've got little doubt that Hess thought he was participating in a coup attempt because otherwise he wouldn't have flown. Nobody was holding... The important point here is that nobody was holding a gun to Hess's head to say, you must fly. It was certainly only Hess's um, decision to do that. And what... what I find interesting in that context is the decision making that he went through in, a, in arriving at the decision to fly. He was actually in quite an isolated position. Unlike the Brits, the German government wasn't run by a cabinet. It was run by a Fuhrer who made decrees from time to time and then left the 
implementation of those decrees to individuals, some of whom were, were more important, uh, were, were trying to just feather their own nest rather than implement any particular uh, decrees or, um, or principles. Hess, I think, was a genuinely sincere Nazi, but he, um, he didn't trust the rest of the leadership. The only one I think he got on well with was Goebbels. He detested Ribbentrop, who was actually nominally at least a major player in foreign policy. And so what, what he would do would be he'd listen to people that he thought he could trust. And that's not unreasonable, is it, in his position? So he would. that's why he um, asked to meet Karl Haushofer, his university professor. He knew he could trust Haushofer. And he relied on a few people. And it was on that basis and what those people were telling him that made him fly. Fortunately for him, I now believe that Karl Haushofer's son, Albrecht, who was, a, who was um, an early member of the anti-Nazi resistance, was actually probably more than likely being uh, feeding him false propaganda and false hope on behalf of the British Peace Party. And that's where uh, British intelligence, I think, were being very, very clever. OK, so were there any other uh, sort of diplomatic channels? I mean, obviously, there are diplomats from uh, neutral countries, uh, places like uh, supposedly, anyway, neutral Spain, um, Sweden, Finland, places like this. Were there any other contacts that we know he was having uh, that might have been about inducing him to uh, uh, think that there was a prospect of peace when there wasn't um, from yes. these diplomatic channels. Yes. So we spoke about the letter of the 23rd of September that had been intercepted by MI5, MI6 and the SOE. The, that letter wasn't responded to. But what happened next was the Finnish art historian, Tancred Berenius, was sent to Geneva in January 41 to meet Karl Burkhardt, who was uh, not the head of, but quite um, senior in the International Red Cross Committee. And it's that meeting and that trip that I believe was the, that provided the impetus for the Hess flight. Um, Berenius was eminently well connected to British society and he, he told Burkhart that, yes, a peace was possible for not, but for not much longer. And that then got back to Hess, who by that time was learning how to fly his plane. And the whole thing, the whole thing fitted together. Arrhenius was back in London by the middle of March, and he reported back to MI6. He had been briefed by... Claude Danzi, who was the deputy head of MI6 prior to him going to Geneva. And it's that, and it's the reaction to that flight that I believe ultimately led Hess to fly. The finer details, however, were provided to Albrecht Haushofer on his trips around Europe in that spring. He went to Madrid, he went to Stockholm, and on the 28th of April, fortnight before the flight, he met Burkhardt in Geneva and then went to Arosa in Switzerland, ostensibly to meet Ilse von Hassel, who was the wife of the uh, leading anti-Nazi uh, resistor. It's at that point, I believe, the final and the finer details were handed to him, enabled Hess to fly a fortnight later. Um, because why would Hess fly to Scotland? If Hess wanted to fly, if you wanted to fly to make peace with Winston Churchill, surely you'd fly to Kent or you'd fly um, to Biggin Hill or, or Hendon or a, an airfield around London. The fact that he flew to Scotland would infer to me that he wasn't expecting to meet a government official and this was a wholly non-governmental initiative, and that's why he flew to Scotland. But in order to fly to Scotland, you need various instructions. You need to know roughly where the anti-aircraft guns are to prevent you being shot down. 
And it's no, it's no coincidence, to my mind, that Hess flew where he did, because it was basically one of the most undefended areas in the British Isles. Not surprisingly, because it's predominantly hillside and heather, so there's not a lot to protect. But that's why Hess nearly got to where he did, because he had basically been coached and told where to fly and where and, and how. Uh, have we got any clues about uh, whether his navigation aids were tampered with? Uh, not tampered with, broke down. So the big debate, Tony, uh, that from a from a navigational point of view, he flew up. He flew up the North Sea far enough out uh, to the east to prevent chain home radar picking him up. Chain home at that time went about 120 miles out into the North Sea. He cleverly flew far enough east to avoid detection by chain home. His big dilemma was knowing when to turn left. If he turned left too soon, he'd fly in over Newcastle, which was heavily defended. If he left it too late, he'd fly in over the North Berwickshire coast, and that too was very heavily defended. There were RAF bases at East Fortune and Drem, and he'd have, he'd have met trouble then. He cleverly turned left at the right time um, and came in over Dunstanborough Castle, where there wasn't a great anti-aircraft uh, defence at all, because there wasn't anything particularly to protect. So that's that. That was what he did, but unfortunately he did it late. And in a letter to his wife that he wrote um, when he was at Spandau in the late forties, he actually made the point that at the crucial time, just when he was relying on his radio equipment, it packed up, and that's why I believe he was late. You'll see a diagram on it of his flight where he doubles back on himself. And that's not, uh, as some people have speculated, waiting for it to get dark. That's the last thing he would have wanted. Um, it was because he he'd, his radio equipment had got lost, had, had gone wrong rather, and he doubled back to his original starting point. So that made him 40 minutes late. And it made the difference between him landing in the landing in the light and landing in dark. Okay, so his radio navigation aids weren't working. So is that is it possible that um, th this is something to do with a, a um, ground station that he's not able to pick up? Is it you know someone switched a ground station off, or is it simply uh, something in the aircraft uh, that's no, gone wrong? No. So what he had on board was. Um, called it the Electra ra uh, Radio Navigation System. And in fairness to the Germans, in terms of aerial navigation, they were ahead of us. And this Electra was a derivation of the Lorenz Blind Landing System that had first come out in the 30s. And basically, it cast a net across the North Sea from two transmitter stations, one at Stavanger in Norway and one at... Um, uh, Husum in Schleswig Holstein. And it basically put beams across the North Sea. So you just had to count how many beams your plane had gone through, tell you roughly where you were at any particular time. And it was a very novel and uh, state of the art system. So but, it, but the cleverness in it was that it used a normal radio receiver. So whilst the system was extremely sophisticated, the actual equipment was quite um, quite standard. So you could, it wasn't obvious when the plane crashed that it had got an Electra system on it, uh, an Electra navigation system on it. We've actually bought one of the receivers part of our research to work out how it worked and what went wrong. And basically, all that would have gone wrong, he'd have probably just counted the wrong number of beams that he'd crossed before he turned left and then lost confidence that he was in the right place. So that system uh, morphed later or was developed into something called SON, 
and then it morphed into something called Consol, which the U-boats used and shipping used right the way through till about 1995 when GPS started to take. Oh, so, I mean, what you're saying is that it may be that he just uh, made some paper errors in the plane as he's doing his own navigation. Correct. Because he was a man there on his own in, a, in one of the fastest planes in the world. Uh, he wasn't particularly high going up the North Sea. Uh, it got a lot to think about at that point in time. So yeah, this, I, is, this is why they have an, a, a separate navigator, isn't it? Normally, yes. Uh, have what's called a board funker sat in the back um and he was also got he would normally guard the machine gun on a on a 110 as well but hess had all this to do himself he also had to think about fuel he had to think about oil um there was a lot going on and it, so we shouldn't be too surprised that he got that bit wrong but that's what in our view um was the fatal mistake uh, now, what about uh, his time in Spandau? Because I know eventually he ended up being the only person in that pr prison in Berlin for many, many years. I think it was he's one of the longest people to ever be in a prison on his own um, as the Cold War wore on and before the fall of the Berlin Wall, and then finally committing suicide, supposedly, in 1987. So... Can you tell us what you make of that suicide, whether, you know, how real it is, whether he was suicided and, and about his stay in Spandau? Yeah. So from Nuremberg, he uh, uh, escaped execution. Um, he had he was found guilty of um, I think two of the four um, offences that the Nazi leaders were accused of. And he was. Um, given life imprisonment. So from Nuremberg, uh, he was flown to Spandau with, seven, uh, with six others. There were seven prisoners. And as the 50s uh, turned into the 60s, the prisoners started being released, normally on humane grounds because they were, they were not well. And the last prisoner to be released before Hess became the sole occupant was uh, Speer. I think 1966. So from 1966 to 1987, um, Rudolf Hess was the only prisoner in a uh, massive Prussian jail that I think had been constructed in the 1870s for about 1,200 men. His day, his days became very tedious. He would be allowed out for a walk around the garden, and. Strangely, as the 60s turned into the 70s, his main preoccupation became the NASA space flights. And he would write to NASA, um, giving them ideas as to how their equipment could be improved. And NASA reciprocated by sending pictures of the moon to Hess when, uh, when they became available. Um, and that tedious existence existed and, co and kept going under the power, uh, four powers and the French, British, American and uh, Russian guards were rotated on a um, monthly basis, I think it was, till August 1987, when Hess was found dead, uh, well, he was found dying, to be more precise, in a summer house that had been uh, converted out of what appeared to me to be a bit of a porter cabin. And he had apparently hung himself from an electricity flex from no more than a height of 18, inch, uh, 18 inches above the ground by the expedient of leaning forward on the flex. Um, there are two camps here. The Spandau um, chief prison warder um, made the case that it was obviously uh, suicide, but Hess had, I think he was an Algerian guard uh, who, who, who acted as a medical orderly. He was absolutely convinced that he'd been to the um, summer house, seen the body, and there were two men that he'd never seen before standing over the body 
the clear implication that uh, they had actually murdered Hess. Will we ever know? The fact of the matter is probably not. Body was released to the Hess family shortly after, and the Hess family uh, conducted their own autopsy. There had already been an official autopsy, and that that um, decided that the death was due to um, asphyxiation by reason of the flex. The Hess family then commissioned a second autopsy by a leading Munich surgeon, and he made the case that because of the shape and the latitude of the bruising, it wasn't actually a hanging, but it was a throttling. Will we ever know the truth? Probably not, um, but there is certainly that um, dichotomy between the two professional opinions as to the cause of death. The body was then buried in the family grave at Unziedel in um, northern Bavaria, and that then attracted the neo-Nazi uh, contingent who would conduct moonlight parades uh, on Hess's birthday each year. So the local council got fed up with that and took the uh, unprecedented step of telling the family to exhume the body, that of, um, I think, Hess's parents, who were also buried there. They were apparently cremated and uh, spread, uh, uh, spread over the Baltic Sea. The story doesn't end there. Um, in 2015, I went to Munich to interview Wolf Hess's, um, Wolf Hess, Hess's grandson. And he told me that when the exhumations had taken place, DNA had also been taken and had been matched against a, a Hess family member and the DNA matched, thus squashing the theory that the man in Spandau wasn't actually Rudolf Hess. There had been a number of, well, there had been at least two books speculating that the man in uh, Spandau was actually a doppelganger. But it would appear to me, and certainly uh, Wolf Hess Jr. was adamant that the man in Spandau was that uh, was was truly his grandfather and uh, was actually Rudolf Hess. So that's the end of <clears throat> the story as far as the physical remains of Rudolf Hess. So, but the debate as to why he flew back in '41 is still very uh, pressing. I mean, it's extraordinary the amount of disinformation. You've just described some of it there, uh, a massive amount of it, with people putting out stuff which, under examination, just simply doesn't hold any water. There's also the extraordinary situation where, as I understand it, his visits from family and friends, etc., in Spandau were extremely limited um, to such an extent that it's pretty obvious that uh, those who were incarcerating Hess wanted to make sure that he, he never t spoke to anybody and on the record whilst he was there and cleared up any of these historical questions, John. I couldn't agree with you more. Couldn't agree with you more. So for the first 29 years, he wouldn't accept visits from the family at all. Um, then he had, I think, a perforated ulcer and had to go to the British military hospital in Berlin for an operation. He wasn't sure if he was going to come out of that. So he then started um, visit, uh, allowing visits by his wife, uh, his sister, his son and his daughter-in-law. I think they started in 1971, around Christmas time. Uh, but they were very, very regimented, very, very controlled. There was no touching allowed, for instance. Uh, the subject matter had to be very carefully monitored. And to my mind, the only reason he was incarcerated and never came out was, as you have just said, to stop him telling the story of 
what actually happened, not in prison, but what were the motivations and what was the true reason behind his flight to uh, Scotland back in 1941. It's also interesting to note that in 1987, Russia was beginning to run out of money. And for the first time ever, um, Mikhail Gorbachev, who was the president at that time, would start using words like perestroika. And it was even mooted that the Russian objection to the release of Hess might be lifted simply because they couldn't afford um, their obligations under the, uh, under the Spandau imprisonment. And in March 1987, this is a statue in Gorbachev met, I think in Moscow from memory, and lo and behold, uh, four months later, Rudolf Hess, a 94-year-old cripple, is found dead, hanging supposedly from an 18-inch noose above the um, floor of his summer house. All seem to be, uh, as I say, I don't think we'll ever know the real, the real truth. <laughs> Uh, well, the other extraordinary thing about this story is that it was a big change uh, over in Berlin during the war, having Hess disappearing off. Uh, somebody that did very well out of all of this was a chap called Martin Bormann. He had been, I understand, uh, an assistant to Hess, uh, and he then took over Hess's role as uh, private secretary to Adolf Hitler. So he made, he became much, much closer and uh, there is a lot of information, allegations, uh, intelligence that's come out since the 1990s that uh, Martin Bormann was working very closely with, Hit, uh, well, as, as, as Hitler's private secretary, he was working very closely with Winston Churchill's private secretary, Desmond Morton, at the end of the war in order to uh, do deals, basically. I wonder what you make of, uh, of, of um, Bormann taking over Hess's role as a potential motive for getting Hess out of the way? Um, I, d I don't believe that, because I think Hess made the decision to fly very much himself. And I would, uh, I would add with that that I think Hitler knew exactly what was going on and was prepared to take the risk as well. I doubt, I don't think Hess trusted Bormann. Bormann was his deputy. But he knew exactly what Borman was doing, and the two men kept apart quite a lot of the time. Borman was um, Hess's deputy, and when it's, I think it's quite in, interesting to note that when Hess flew, Borman wasn't promoted as Hess's direct replacement. Uh, Hess was the deputy Führer. Borman never held that role. I guess in all, all practical terms he may have done. But I think Hitler saw Bormann and Hess as two very different people in two very different roles. So I don't underplay Bormann's um, potential or his power. Certainly there are stories that at the end of the war, rather than uh, be killed by Russian tanks in Berlin, he ended the war in... in um, Older shot, I think, uh, or he was lit, he was grabbed and spent some time in Britain prior to meeting his end in South America in, near Buenos Aires. How much of this we will ever find out, God, God only knows. Um, that's not really what we've been concentrating on. We've been trying to work out simply why Hess flew, that all of these consequences are... Uh, require some degree of research to see that these cruises. Yes, yeah, certainly. Look, I mean, all, all I'm saying is I'm trying to pin you down again, you know, on this idea of whether there was really ever any prospect um, of uh, a, a coup d'etat in Britain, which would have, um, you know, brought peace between Britain and Nazi Germany, or whether the whole thing was just a ruse. I'm going to, I'm going to final, finally ask you to put your put your cards on the table there, John, um, and uh, and and just share with us whether you think there was really ever any prospect, or whether Hess was tricked. Um, right. My honest opinion is I believe Hess thought 
there was a prospect of a negotiated negotiated settlement. Else, why fly at all? Um, that's why. But I don't think he was completely confident that he would achieve that goal. And that's essentially what he told Eugene Bird in Spandau. And Bird was the um, prison officer that I referred to earlier. Do I think British intelligence lured him in? Yes. Do I think British intelligence was sure that he would come? No. Do I think that Hess's arrival took them by surprise? Definitely. Was there actually a peace party there ready to wait, re ready waiting? Quite possibly, and that's probably the most controversial thing I'll say tonight. Um, what we would love to know is who was there ready at Dundonald Airfield waiting for the Methodist BF 110 to land? What would have happened when he landed? Um, where would he have gone that first night? Those are, those are the really interesting questions. Uh, what did Hess think was going to happen? We've yet to learn that. That's a really interesting thing. And that's why Hess may have met his end in the way that he did some 41 years later. So in answer to your question, I think Hess thought that there was a possibility of a negotiated settlement. Was he lured? Well, certainly British intelligence were involved. We know that for a fact. We know that Danzi was briefing Berenius. We know that British agents were uh, trying to influence Hess in various ways through various agents, not least of which house, not least of which was, was household. Would there have been a coup attempt in in Britain? No, but there could have been an inadvertent civil war had Hess have landed and made it known that he was seeking parley with the king. It's interesting. In the 80s, Hess's lawyer, Alfred Seidel, tried to make the case for Hess's release. He was what was called a parlementar, and that is basically a peace, a peace negotiator. You know, in the old films, you see people wa uh, walking up to the enemy with holding a white flag. That's what's called a parlementar in Germany. And Seidel tried to make the case that that's what Hess was actually trying to do, negotiate a settlement between the parties. But I don't think he was, because if he was really genuinely going to negotiate a settlement with Britain, why not use an embassy? Why not do a deal in the Madrid embassy? Reason, he wasn't trying to do a deal with the British government. This was a non-governmental negotiation that he was anticipating. And the only person, to my knowledge, that could give him what he wanted would have been the king. And that's where the really interesting aspect of the Duke of Kent's role was. You know, uh, Hess made the case he was coming to fly to see the Duke of Hamilton. That would have been a completely pointless exercise. The Duke of Hamilton has got a constitutional position. He was the foremost peer in Scotland. But he could no more make peace with Germany than you and I, Tony. <laughs> he had to be a negotiator. He had to be a middleman for yeah. a non-governmental negotiation. And that's why I'm very happy to believe that Hess thought he was flying to meet the king. Could have been the whole thing a, a very, very clever ruse as well. Anyway, uh, John Harris, thanks very much for joining us. I wonder if you could just uh, finish by reminding us of the title of the book and if anyone is interested in following this up, uh, where they can get hold of your latest? Um, well, our latest book is uh, Rudolf Hess, Truth at Last, published by Unicorn in 2019. We're currently working on uh, a new book, which hopefully will be out later this year, um, called uh, 10th of May 1941, Rudolf Hess and his forlorn British coup attempt. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed.